All right, so I'm doing another one of these. It's been uh, it's been a couple of months now, and uh, you can see I got my quarantine hair going on. I was out in the wind, so it's all swept up and everything. But you know what? We're here to talk about the color out of space. So the color out of space is you know it was an H.P. Lovecraft short story that came out in 1927, I think, and I said back in October when I did my H.P. Lovecraft video, I mentioned that there was a movie coming out soon and that I was expecting it to be good for all the wrong reasons, and I I missed a spot shaving, whatever. Uh, I was expecting it to be good for all the wrong reasons because, you know, it had Nicolas Cage in it and it was made by a director who had been out of the game for a while, and so I was thinking, yeah, this looks like a train wreck and it'll be hilarious. But the movie had a limited release, so I didn't see it until the other day, and I'm happy to say I was totally wrong. Okay, that movie, it's a genuinely great horror movie, okay? And while there are some parts that are funny, that's not at all what makes it so great. Like, it takes advantage of being a film, and so it's actually able to give different types of horror, and it keeps Lovecraft's eldritch horror in a... It, well, it keeps it intact, I guess is the best way to say it, because what a lot of these movies do is they make the mistake of, you know, showing the monster or uh, explaining too much about the gods or whatever. And so it just doesn't work that well because in Lovecraft's mythos, the fear comes from uh, realizing how tiny we are in the grand scheme of the universe. And granted, Lovecraft is a little one note when it comes to that sort of thing. So The Color of Space is... Well, the original story is kind of confusing to explain, even though it's not that complex, really. Basically, a meteor comes and crashes to the Earth, and it has this weird color coming out of it. And we don't know what this is. Is it a substance or a living creature? And we never really find out what it is at all, but it's just... It, it's there, and then it starts mutating all the plant and animal life around uh, the, this farm where it crashes, and then it starts killing it and then the people that live there start going insane, and they start wasting away, and eventually they all die. And, oh, by the way, um, from this point on there will be spoilers for the book and the film, so just be aware of that, because it's very difficult to talk about this without going into that. But basically, yeah, the film, the only place I can find it is on YouTube, but it's still really, really solid horror movies, so if you're a fan of stuff like The Thing, then I think you'll like this one. The book's story is pretty simple, but the way it's told is kind of weird, and Lovecraft did that sometimes. Like, basically there's an unnamed narrator, and it's told from first-person POV, and he is like a surveyor uh, who's going out into the wilderness to try and help people build a water reservoir, and while he's out there, the locals are saying, oh, don't go to this part of the woods, some crazy shit happened there like 40 years ago, and then so eventually he goes out and finds this old man who people think is crazy, and the old man tells him the story of what happened 40 some odd years ago. And I mean, some people might like that because they feel it adds to the mystery or it adds to the horror or something. Personally, I feel it detracts from the horror because one, it obfuscates things, and two, it leaves you with this feeling like, okay, this guy might actually just be crazy and making stuff up, or he might be exaggerating, or something like that. So, for, for me personally, that takes away from the horror, whereas the movie is just told in a pretty traditional way. Like, it's showing these people while stuff is happening and you're watching it. Great. Probably the biggest single improvement that the movie makes over the story is that it gives the characters actual personality. Now, in the book, well, like like we're saying, like I said, we're getting all the information third hand, so it's just there's this farmer named Gardner and his family and his wife was named this, his son was named this, and they none of them get any personality or anything, whereas in the film they actually do have personality. And it has I mean, it has Nicolas fucking Cage in it and Nicolas Cage basically gives three different types of performances. There's the sleepwalking performance, where he's clearly just in it for a paycheck and doesn't care. Like, this would be him in the 2014 Left Behind movie, or in Ghost Rider. And uh, then number two is, hey, I can actually act when I feel like it, Nicolas Cage. This would be in him in uh, Leaving Las Vegas or the National Treasure movies. And then number three, my personal favorite, is the 
over-the-top, crazy, freak-out Nicolas Cage. You know what I'm talking about. Open it! 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 You're a bad man. And this thing, the writer, he feeds on them and he's hungry. Hallelujah! Now, the over-the-top freakout Nicolas Cage is hilarious, okay? And I was expecting that to be in this movie, or at least I was hoping for that to be in this movie. And there are one or two moments like that. You know, I did everything I was supposed to do. I followed every fucking rule in the book. In the end, they still fucking taste like chips. You know what? Fuck that. Okay, coming up! But, overall, it's, um... He, he is giving a good performance. You know, this is his I-can-actually-act-when-I-feel-like-it type performance. And, well, yeah, there's not a whole lot else to say there. He, like, he's an actual good actor giving a good performance, and all the other characters as well, they have some personality. Like, his daughter has a personality and realizes, hey, this color is acting kind of weird. Some stuff's going on. Let's figure this out. And his other son, or... N not his younger son, because he's just a kid, but uh, his older son and his wife also have some personality. And then, um, so as this uh, color is kind of driving them crazy, we start to see that. And we don't just hear third hand, like, oh yeah, they, they went crazy, it was, it was weird. Like, we're actually seeing the results of this. And through that, one, like, obviously caring about characters makes everything scarier, but two, they actually combine the eldritch horror with some other stuff, like they put in some uh, really good body horror and some good psychological horror, because we're seeing all this happen, and also once you actually see some of the mutations that the color creates, it's... yeah, it's it's genuinely pretty disturbing. Like I said, if you liked The Thing, you'll, you'll probably like this one. I mean, hell, even Tommy Chong is in this movie, and so that was part of why I assumed, like, oh yeah, that's just gonna be hilarious and terrible. And I was thinking it might be funny on purpose, but I wasn't thinking it was going to be a good H.P. Lovecraft horror story. But no, Tommy Chong, he, it's, he doesn't have a huge role in this movie, but in his role, he's kind of funny at first, but then at the end, even he gets some good, uh, really creepy moments where you're like, Jesus Christ, that is... I Wow, that's, uh, that's kind of fucked up, okay. There are, of course, a few issues with this movie. Nothing, uh... Nothing really major, in my opinion, but, you know, there, there are some things. And, well, the first one being that some people might feel that Nicolas Cage's freakouts and the humorous bits throughout would take away from the horror. Personally, I didn't feel, feel that way, but, you know, it, it, it happens. And um, the other one being that just because it's film and because it's a visual medium, we, um, we do lose out on some of the incomprehensible nature of the color and of Lovecraft's uh, creatures that he makes. Because, uh, like I even said in my Lovecraft video, that like, as soon as you show the monster, you're losing most of what makes it scary, because what makes it scary is that it's incomprehensible to humans. Uh, and the color in The Color Out of Space was supposed to be like something that no human had ever seen, and they couldn't describe it because it was like no other color. And... Well, in the movie, you just can't do that. Like, you can't make a new color that's never um, existed before. Like, you can try combining them, but that, that's about it. And so the color is just this sort of magenta uh, throughout. And I know that, like, technically magenta doesn't exist. It's just uh, our eyes perceive colors that way weirdly. But still, the point is... Like, when we see it, it's just like, oh yeah, it's this pinkish purple, and so it doesn't really feel that scary. But at the same time, in the book, we we never really got any sort of idea of what the color was. Like, was it some sort of substance, some sort of chemical? Was it like a, a creature? Did it have any sort of sentience? Or was it just an animal lashing out? Like, like you know, was it... Like, we get the feeling it's feeding on these people and on the animals and all that, but we don't, uh, we, we don't really know if it's doing that maliciously or not. Whereas in the film, 
we get a pretty good idea that, yeah, it is a malicious entity. But, but, that said, it's still way out there and really weird and crazy and creepy, and we still don't have any real understanding of it. And that comes through really hardcore in this one scene at the end of the movie where we get a brief, well, maybe not brief, but we get a sort of glimpse of what the planet that the color came from is like, and it's just, even though it's visual, we just, you can't make any sense of what this is. Like, we know it's some place with all these creatures and things, but we have no idea what it is or what's going on, and that's what Lovecraft is supposed to do. And um, I just, I think this movie being an independent film probably helps with that. Or, wait, was it independent? I'm actually... <laughs> I'm actually not so too, totally sure about that, but I, it wasn't some big budget Hollywood thing, which um, that that's what I think that's what saved it in the end is because if it had been a big budget Hollywood thing, they probably would have just turned it into a standard monster movie, and then it would have lost its identity. And I mean, maybe we we would have gotten some good Nicolas Cage freakouts, but that's about it. And there is one death in the movie: uh, Nicolas Cage's older son Benny. Like, when he dies, that was, uh, God, that, that, that was the one point in the movie where I was like, dude, you're, you're a dipshit. Like, you put yourself in that position and you have no one to blame but yourself. Whereas, uh, throughout, throughout the rest of the movie, I was thinking like, wow, these, uh, these characters are doing everything right, but they're just, they're just fucked because this alien entity is there. Whereas, you know, if, and if you are fans of horror movies, and even if you're not, you've probably seen a couple where you're just like, oh, go out into the woods unarmed and alone while you're taking a piss. That's, that sounds safe, and then they die, and you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm not even scared. You're an idiot. Like, this movie avoids that for the most part, and then Benny happens. And weirdly enough, the movie has kind of a happier ending than the book does, because so... Basically, in the story, it was like this whole family died, and when the people went to investigate, um, I think only one of them was left alive, and there's like, you know, we're gonna put her out of her misery, so he kills her with an axe. And uh, then the color, like, escapes the earth, but uh, you can, uh, the guy saw that there was a little piece of it that uh, broke off and stayed in the well, so it's still there. And he knows that, yeah, that. This thing's still here, it can still be killing people, so don't go over there. And uh, so the narrator, who again is never named, uh, decides, you know what, they're gonna build the reservoir there, but I'm never drinking the water from it because it's probably tainted. And so you know, oh shit, people are, people are gonna start dying. Whereas in the movie, um, the narrator is actually made a character in the story, his name is Ward, and um, he's also a decent character by the way, and um, he's the only one that survives at the end. And it's not made totally clear what happened with the color. Like, I, having read it, obviously, I knew, like, it left the Earth and went off into space again, but uh, if you hadn't read it, then it might have been kind of confusing. But um, it's also never totally made clear that a piece of it stayed behind. Like, you see a little mutated bug that's still there, but it's not made explicit that, yeah, we're, we're still in trouble. So, weirdly enough, the movie has a bit of a happier ending than the book did. It's, it's, um, I don't know, it's just kind of weird. But at the same time, they give, uh, the narration at the end, Ward narrates at the beginning and the end, and he uses actual lines from the story, which I think is really good. It adds to the creep factor and everything, but, uh, it, it doesn't feel totally justified in that case, because, you know, in the in, in the book, well, I'll just call the narrator Ward, it's whatever. Like, in the book, Ward knew for a fact, yep, there's still a piece there, the water's tainted, so I'm not gonna drink it. Whereas in the film, it's just like, he comes across as maybe not paranoid, but definitely uh, traumatized and everything. But at the same time, like, he was actually there this time, so he knows for a fact, yeah, this is all real, it's not the crazy ramblings of an old man. Uh, some other small things I liked about this um, were... Like I said, I, I really liked the body horror. I know I, I haven't focused on that a whole lot, but some of the shit that goes on in this movie, uh, I don't even want to spoil because, like, uh, around halfway through, that's when shit hits the fan and everything gets real, and from then on, it's just crazy stuff after crazy stuff. But uh, there's a scene where 
a bunch of alpacas, I almost said llamas, sorry, a bunch of alpacas get infected by the color and merged into this one hideous monstrosity, which is like the thing, and uh, Nicolas Cage has to kill it, and we don't get a clear look at it, but I, I, that kind of makes it creepier, I think. Um, but we do get some nice gore when it gets killed and everything. And um, there's a couple other good gore moments, but this movie doesn't rely on those. You know, it's not like a slasher flick where, like, oh, there's a killer out there and the only reason to watch it is because boobs and because you want teenagers to get their heads cut off. But th there are some good gore scenes in there. Uh, I really hate to keep harping on this, but Nicolas Cage is funny at a couple of points, but for the most part, really solid performance. The CGI in this is not very good, but it is sparingly used, so if you see, like, in the first uh, 20 or 30 minutes, if you see those little bad bits of CG, just know they don't use it too much after that. Like, they get into the practical effects, and it's it's a lot better. And, you know, they use shadows and everything to hide it, so it's, it, it's just a lot better. And, like I said, uh, most of the time the characters act rationally and they act smart, and they just get killed anyways because the villain is that much more powerful. Like, that, and that's, I, I don't want to say more than anything that uh, makes this a good Lovecraft adaptation, but that definitely helps make this a good Lovecraft adaptation because, like, had the creature not been all that, uh, I, I feel weird calling the color a creature, but whatever, had the eldritch abomination not really been all that uh, powerful and it only killed people because they were stupid, then the Eldritch Abomination wouldn't have seemed that scary. Whereas in this, the people acted smart, but the Eldritch Abomination is just that much more powerful and that much smarter than they are. So um, yeah, overall, I'm kind of rambling now, but overall, really, really solid Lovecraft adaptation, which I didn't think would ever get done. I will fully admit I was wrong there. And uh, apparently this director also wants to make the Dunwich Horror next, which I haven't read that one, but hey, if if he was able to do this one, then knock yourself out, man. I, I want to see him do either the, At the Mountains of Madness or um, Shadow Over Innsmouth next, but, you know, after Dunwich Horror, and um, yeah, just really solid horror movie, so if you want uh, a good watch in the quarantine and you got a couple dollars to spend, then uh, go rent it or buy it on YouTube. Thanks for watching me ramble on about a horror movie that I liked, and uh, thanks for my patrons for paying for it. Thanks especially to Apo Sabalainen, Brother Santotis, Charles Gull, Christopher Hawkins, Christopher Quinten, Joel, Joseph Pendergraft, Taylor Briggs, Tobacco Crow, and Vi Victus, or Ve Victus, I'm actually not sure how to say that, but uh, you know, all these names here, you guys are, you guys are pretty great. <laughs> I, uh, I like you, and um, if you can't afford to be a patron, or if you don't want to be a patron for whatever reason, I can't imagine why you wouldn't, then please just like this video and uh, comment on it to help it in the, in the algorithm, and subscribe to my channel, and uh, that, uh, well, yeah, that should, that should be everything, and uh, if you guys liked my, uh, the movie is better than the book series that I'm doing, then uh, keep asking for it, because I have a few more ideas.